I'm Nikki Lowe and welcome to the Wisdom for Working Mums podcast show where I share insights and interviews that support women to combine their family, work and life in a more successful and sustainable way. Welcome to this episode. I'm your host Nikki Lowe and thank you for joining me today. I want to share with you today a really important concept about the female happiness gap. And it's particularly important at this time of year because when I'm recording this episode and when it's launching, it's the start of the festive season and it's meant to be the happiest time of the year, right? You know, it's full of joy. But time and time again, when I speak to women, they're feeling overwhelmed, exhausted and like they're failing. And I think this year, time of year just brings that into sharper focus they can feel like despite having it all, it's not leading to them feeling happier and they somehow feel guilty or even shame about that. So I wanted to share with you this concept of the paradox of declining female happiness. And it's important to know really for two reasons. One, to know that you're not alone if you're feeling like you should be happier than you are. But two, that this trend isn't looking to change unless we do something about it. So what do we know about the female happiness gap? Well, since the 1970s, we've seen a significant reduction in female happiness. And we now have a gender happiness gap emerging. And it's not looking good. So back in the 1970s, when this research was started, women typically reported higher subjective well-being than men. So they were reporting that they felt happier than men. But there's this paradox that started to emerge of women's declining relative well-being. And it's found across various data sets and is pervasive across different demographic groups and in different industrialized countries. So what we know are women are outliving men in most every country of the world. But while women are living longer, it's clear that their well-being is not better off for this. So what What we know is that as women have gained political, economic and social freedoms, you kind of would expect with that, that they should feel more contented relative to men. So the more we've kind of gained in, I suppose, reducing gender inequality, the more that you would expect that to have an impact on our well-being and happiness. But according to the data, this isn't the case. And it's not just from the data, it's also from the anecdotal evidence I've got with working with my female clients. So the paradox of declining female happiness was pointed out by economists Betsy Stevenson and Justin Walfers, and they're both kind of high profile economists. But what's also interesting is their life partners. So they live together and they share children and they analyze the happiness trends of US citizens between 1970 and 2005 and found a very surprising result. So Stevenson and Wolf has discovered that American women rated their overall life satisfaction higher than men in the 1970s. But after that point, women's happiness scores decreased and pretty rapidly, whilst men's scores stayed roughly stable. And by the 1990s, women were significantly less happy than men. And men continue to enjoy a higher sense of subjective well-being. Um, So it's at least as high, if not higher than women's. So across those 35 years that that research was, was conducted, so 1970 to 2005, we saw kind of significant advances in women's rights and financial power. And in particular, in 1979, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women So it's known as CEDAW, so the Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. So that was adopted and is the most comprehensive international instrument to protect the human rights of women. And it's actually the second most ratified UN Human Rights Treaty after the Convention on the Rights of Children. And it's got ratifications across 189 nations. And it was adopted in 1979. And it legally binds the signatory governments to end all forms of discrimination against women in public and private life, including in the family. And really, the aim is to achieve 
substantive equality between men and women, just not in laws, but also in reality on the ground. And despite that coming into place in 1979, in industrialized com- countries, we have seen women become significantly less happy in recent decades. Stevens and Wolf has found that the gap between male and female happiness was also in Europe and over approximately the same period had a strikingly similar trend to the magnitude of the US gender happiness gap. So what they've now kind of looked at is that it wasn't just in the US, it actually applied across all industrialized countries. So why is this? What? We don't actually have all the answers to this, but the evidence supports that the idea that women's rights and roles in the home in the US and Europe have not moved in step change with the workplace. Therefore, women with jobs do most, if not all of the chores and childcare, and they're really shouldering a dual burden that cuts into their well-being. You know, long commutes, We also know with the data for British women um, in particular have an impact. And this was kind of changed during the pandemic. But if, you know, if we're seeing organisations really asking people to go back into their place of work, that's going to continue. But we also think that these results are really about the cognitive comparisons that we have had over the decades. So women are less happy and notice discrimination because they are now comparing themselves to everyone around them, including men. And perhaps traditionally minded women were basing their identities more firmly on their gender roles. And so they were only comparing and evaluating their privilege and opportunities with other women. So that's what we believe is part of this. As women's rights and opportunities have increased, it seems that Women have um, internalized really more complex and optimistic expectations of what life should be like and are really judging their reality against those. So what they believe might be part of the research is if you asked a housewife in the 1970s how satisfied she was with her lot in life, she probably just reflected on were things going well at home But actually, the same question today evokes evaluations across many areas of our lives. And we're seeing this come out in the research. You know, women are burning out more than men and more than they were a year ago. And it's just escalating faster in women than men. And the the statistics are pretty damning. And we know that from the Women in Workplace report, women with a partner and children are five and a half times more likely than their male counterparts to do all or most of the household work. And even when women are the primary breadwinners, they still do more work at home. So women who bring in more than 50% of their family income are still three and a half times more likely to do all or most of the household work than men in the same situation. And there's a brilliant lady called the Mama Attorney on social media. And she supports particularly women in the US. Um, She's an attorney that supports um, working mums around discrimination. And she talks about, you know, mothers are stuck between an economy that tells them that work comes first and a society that tells them that kids come first. But she really questions, you know, who's advocating for the mother's needs in this? Because it's leading to an entire generation of burnt out women. And if you think about it, we've got all these unrealistic expectations to be the perfect woman, you know, the beauty and body standards, the home standards, the motherhood standards. And when we don't live up to those, it can intensify our experience of guilt. Um, And then if you load on to that being the ideal worker and wanting to really achieve in our careers and, and do fulfilling work in our careers, it's leading to higher rates of depression, anxiety, these lower life satisfaction scores that we're seeing because we've got this conflicted sense of identity. But you add in kind of the motherhood load and the discrimination and marginalization in the workplace. The fact that we are carrying an inequality of division of household labor, do you know, it's no wonder that our happiness scores are declining. So if we're not careful, we can get stuck feeling a bit hopeless and helpless about this. But I'm, you know, this is why the work that I do, I am so passionate about because I've obviously experienced the burnout and I've also experienced experimenting with, well, how do I find happiness and well-being? And I've tried taking work out the equation to make that work. You know, I'm in a privileged position that I could try that. And actually, 
it didn't make me happier and it didn't solve my well-being crisis. And that was what was the aha moment for me, that for professional women, we want the intellectual engagement and flow that our work brings, but we want to do it in a way that we can combine with being a mum and showing up in our personal lives like we want to. So that's why I'm so passionate about helping women and learn what we've told we've been told that we should be doing you know to redefine what success looks like for us you know the box of working motherhood is filled with hidden traps that keep us feeling like we're constantly falling short and we feel frustrated and disappointed and anxious and tired and disillusioned but it's no wonder you know we're we're living in a system that like on paper might support women but actually isn't fully so we've kind of swallowed all these rules about what it takes to to get on in life, you know, be a good girl, do well in school, work hard in your career, get married, buy a house, raise children, own nice things, take nice holidays. And it's kind of this promised land that if we tick all those things off, but actually for so many of us, we're realizing that, ah, it's not necessarily answering our well-being and, and our happiness needs. And I, I love the work of Dr. Valerie Rain, and she talks about they used to burn us at the stakes and now they just hand us the torches and we're like lighting ourselves up trying to do it all. You know, as we've been given more opportunity in this world, we're burning ourselves out by working harder and harder, doing more to play the game and as the data is showing, it's not leading to our happiness. You know, some would argue maybe we let's just go back to the 1970s then if we were happier then. But I just don't think it's as simple as that. You know, back in the 1970s, they did have lower expectations of what was possible. And as I said, I've tried to take work out of my life and be the housewife and mother. And it didn't make life easier or make me happier. And for some people it might, but it's about understanding what does happiness and success look like to you? If we strip back all of this, because I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to tolerate living a life of declining happiness. Or when we're, when we're, there's this gender happiness gap, you know, that just does not feel like it's something that we should be tolerating and just going, going, well, that's where the statistics are going. We've just got to ride this. Because I don't want my daughter to have to continue riding that wave of declining female happiness either. So I'm taking back control of what I can and influencing the things that are in my control as much as I can. And I want to make an impact in my professional life whilst also being able to show up in my personal life in a happy and healthy way. And if you do too, then I'd like to invite you to come and join me for a free webinar that I'm delivering called Success Without Sacrifice. And I'll be sharing the high performance success strategies for career-driven women who want to thrive in work and life. It's taking place in February, so you can get on the wait list now and I can send you the information so that you can register. And basically, I'm going to be covering the six domains that influence your ability to thrive personally and professionally. So you can start getting forensic as to what is it that supports and enables my well-being and happiness. And I'm going to be using a practical and evidence-based approach to how you can thrive in your career and your personal life without sacrificing your sanity, well-being or happiness. Because well-being is a highly individualized, dynamic and subjective state that's really influenced by a complex combination of your individual preferences and circumstances. And what I'm going to be sharing in this webinar is the specific factors that enhance and detract from your individual well-being across all aspects of your life, both living well and working well, helping you to understand how you can reverse this worrying and gender happiness. And if you want to get more information on this, head over to this podcast page, which is wisdomforworkingmums.co.uk forward slash 96. So that's wisdomforworkingmums.co.uk forward slash the number nine, number six. And you can find the link there to get on the wait list for the webinar where I'm going to be sharing lots of information and a really practical and evidence-based approach about how we can reverse the worrying trend on the female happiness gap. As always, thanks for listening. And until next time, take care. If you've enjoyed this episode of Wisdom for Working Mums, please share it on social media and with your friends and family. I'd love to connect with you too. So if you head over to wisdomforworkingmums.co.uk, you'll find a link on how to do this. 
And if you love the show and really want to support it, please go to iTunes, write a review and subscribe. You'll be helping another working mum find this resource too. Thanks so much for listening.